Thank you all for joining. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you. For, thank you for the team for inviting me to be the first presenter on this uh, Python meetup series. We hope to have a really successful series of Python presentations for that. And again, uh, repeating what uh, Roman said, it's important that everyone be involved. And please, if you have something that you want to talk about, something that you think is interesting for the community, please share it and please uh, uh, sign up yourselves for, for being the next presenter. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Appier. Appier is a, a simple yet powerful uh, Python web framework that I built together with some guys at Hive Solutions. Uh, and I'm going to explain how to bring, how to use it to bring uh, joy to the web app development. Uh, so let me tell, let me start by telling you how it all started, and uh, let me clarify uh, that this started not um, not as a not as an example of uh, how to reinvent the wheel, but out of necessity. Back in 2013, iSolutions was a pretty small agency, but with really large customers like Microsoft, Memory Business, others. Um, and we used Flask a lot. Uh, was basically, we used Flask for all of our backend API uh, or REST API uh, infrastructure. We used it for a lot of web apps also. Uh, and we used to extend it. Uh, using a series of extensions that we packed together named Flex Warm that provided things like data layer that we felt was really important and something that was really missing from Flask, uh, internationalization support, and uh, a lot of uh, filters and, um, and symbols that we exposed to uh, most of them, the template to, uh, to provide a better way of, uh, or a simpler and faster way uh, of creating web apps. Um, time has passed in Flask started seeing it uh, limited for our, for our requirements. And we were, f were facing a, an option between forking Flask as a project, that is always probably the worst idea possible, and uh, rebuilding it from scratch, or starting a new framework from scratch, taking inspiration from, from it. Uh, we decided for a second, and we started building Appier from scratch as a new framework with, a lot, with lots of inspiration from, from Flask. Um, and yeah, the, the basic idea was to build something as simple as Flask, but with some batteries included. Flask is a, a really minimalist and simplistic approach to the, to the web app development process, and wanted to bring more batteries, more features, more infrastructure. We started with that model, and, um, and you may ask, why, why not using Django? Uh, Django follows the batteries included. Uh, Modo, it contains everything, data layer, ORM, uh, inside of the data layer, a lot of infrastructure for validation of models, uh, internationalization support, everything is there. But at the time we thought that, um, that Django has too many things. So, uh, for instance, by using Django, you can meet yourself for, with things like code generation. Whenever you want to start a project, you run a command with Django, something like Django and me, create project and we, it generates a lot of code that you don't own, because you don't understand, and we think that's really a terrible idea. Uh, whenever you use, for instance, Django Migrations, uh, you know that Django Migration is unofficial, but it's still uh, an extension that is open, that's, that's used by, by a lot of people, and that generates uh, also code that is not uh, simple to understand and, um, and owned by, 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 by you. Uh, so we think that the approach that Django has, where a lot of constraints and a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, guidelines to the, to the web development process forces you to like a prison where you need to develop their way, otherwise you're not kind of uh, following the Django way. And we think that's really con it constrains a lot. Uh, Flask, on the other side, is really minimalist. Uh, it's really verbose. You own the code. If you want to, to build uh, a new application, you start by uh, creating the app and then you add a new route or new view. Um, and it's really cool. but. There's always something missing. If you want to build a web and a web app, or even a, 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 just a, a REST API, you can most probably is going to face somewhere in the road with something like, the, for instance, data persistent issues. Issues you need, you need to persist data, uh, and Flask doesn't offer that out of the box. And we, we really thought that was a real limitation, and now Flask works. So we tried to put Appier in between both. So kind of follow the um, basic idea of Flask. So keeping it minimal, keeping it verbose. Uh, you really own your code. You understand everything that is there. You, you wrote it yourself. 
so yeah, that's what we call some batteries included. Um, some overall design decisions that we took uh, when building up here. I think one of the most interesting ones is that we, we wanted to build something that was object oriented in nature. And, uh, and this is opposed to the flask way of, of thinking. A lot of things, for instance, views are just normal modules with uh, global functions. Uh, we wanted it to be object oriented from top to bottom. So everything, so the main classes in, um, in app here are the app controller and model ones. There's also the part one that's, that represents an extension to the, um, to the, um, to the base code of your engine. Um, then we wanted to have the data model layer out of the box. So it's really important to have uh, something similar to an OR and something that would allow a developer to persist data somewhere in a MongoDB, in a TinyDB database, in a, in a file, but something that allowed us to persist some kind of data out of the box. We wanted it to be uh, REST API friendly, so built uh, to be easy to uh, create uh, a base, some kind of back-endish um, web app uh, to support these REST API based in JT. Uh, remember that back, back then we were developing a lot of mobile applications that rely on back-end servers, um, providing that kind of functionality for persistent data in the business logic. Uh, we want it to be extensible by design, and again, something that uh, follows the principle of, of Flask. Everything in Flask should be easily accessible. We want it to be also easy to extend, but we want it to be even easier than Flask. So, for instance, every 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 single uh, one of the main classes, uh, the ones that I told, so app, controller, model, and <coughs> part, inherit from uh, from an observable, and they keep triggering a lot of events. So the main strategy for uh, for extending Appier is by measuring for events in the workflow and then intercepting these events and, um, and then controlling this workflow. And we want it to be scalable and performant. And this is related to be the, the final topic that we think it's it's really the killer feature. Uh, we want it to, we want it to be asynchronous by uh, nature and built from scratch to be asynchronous based on coroutines and features. Uh, basically, this is the way it's in that works. Uh, for those who know with Python 3 and 5, was this, this is the way Core Python 2 will we'll talk that uh, further. So, this is how uh, a simple um, Hello World web app uh, looks like. Uh, for those of you that um, know Flask, and by the way, uh, let me ask, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with Flask? Please raise your hand. Okay, not many. Okay. Yeah. Again, I was going to ask also Jenny. What about Jenny? A lot more. Okay. <laughs> what about Python? How many of you have gone with Python? <laughs> okay. Good number. Better, right? yeah. Okay. Um, so this is how a uh, simple Hello World uh, application looks like. Uh, this this basically returns um, a response with the content type uh, text plane and Hello World. <coughs> And it's, it's really similar to Flask, the only visible difference is that the route itself is defined inside, inside the, the app class instead of being defined inside a module as a global function. Another example, and showing you why we are really, or why Appier is really good and fits really well with, um, with that REST API use case scenario. So basically here, we're defining a route as, uh, as a JSON route. This, uh, this kind of creates a different behavior on how this on how it calls to this route will, will work. So, for instance, if an exception is raised all the way up to the top layer of right here, they would be automatically serialized into JSON. Obviously, they, this dictionary is going to be serialized into JSON. And even things like uh, we'll see further that we have things like access control. So we kind of redirect. So we define, for instance, that this route should be only used by admin-based uh, users. Um, if this happens with this JSON, um, this, with, with this parameter JSON here, uh, you wouldn't be redirected to the login page. You receive a 403, I guess, uh, error code saying that you are not allowed to access that route. So really works well with um, for REST APIs. OK, so. We've seen some global aspects on how IPO works. Uh, it's, so I think everyone should be quite uh, aware of how 
how it would work to build an our world application. Let me now focus on what I do think uh, differentiates uh, Appier from, um, from, for instance, Flask and Django. And, um, and one of those features is uh, the asynchronous support that, uh, that is built in on Appier. Uh, talking about uh, asynchronous support or talking about the synchronous IO uh, is always, is always like talking, or it, it always should be remember us of these basic scalability problem, the C10K problems, it's a well-known problem. Again, who knows uh, what C10K is? Just, okay. So let me, let me explain for those of you who don't know what the C10K is. So C10K is a, is a classic uh, scalability problem uh, where it defines that a server, and for this case it should be an HTTP server, it applies to any kind of server, it should be able to handle 10,000 simultaneous connections. This, this should look really demanding, but, uh, and it was back in 2000, I think that's when this, um, this problem arise. But now it should be really easy with uh, things like Nginx and Node.js. And they, basically this problem is the foundation of all these solutions <coughs> that involve uh, what's the, what's the so-called asynchronous non-blocking I.O. and the solution involving event loop. Uh, when you hear that, okay, Node.js scales very well, it's the best thing in the world, that's, if you, if you go to the original presentations, uh, they always talk about this C10K, now we're talking about the C100K and the C1M, so basically maintaining 100,000 or 1 million connections simultaneously. To be able to handle this correctly, there are a ton of challenges, but basically the best solution is to, is to, to have a so-called uh, a single non-blocking I.O. solution based on the group. And something that we, that's, that's done by Nginx and OGX. Um, obviously, we had three different objectives when we built this C support to be scalable, obviously, this is the foundation of the, of the, of the solution. Uh, we want it to be compatible, and this is really challenging, to be compatible um, from Python 2.6 all the way to Python uh, 3.6, and having kind of a common language or a common uh, code uh, signature, it's quite challenging, it's quite demanding, and the solution was, was, was quite uh, interesting. And we wanted it to be simple, so we wanted, we wanted people to build asynchronous uh, applications or web applications just, just pretty much the same way they would, they would build, build typical blocking applications, okay? So this was really important. I think we've achieved that, uh, most of it Python uh, 3.5 plus because there were, there's a lot of new things coming in uh, that came with Python 3.5. So we, we, we used the um, the kind, of, the kind of the facto so, 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 solution um, that a sync IO provided us in uh, Python 3.4. So using what's what's called semi coroutines. And for those of you that know what Go is, anyone in the audience know what Go is? Um, they have what they call Go routines, and Go routines are pure pure coroutines. So it's it's tricky to define what's the difference between semi coroutines, but keep in mind that the approach is a bit different. Uh, this is kind of a software kind of solution, it's a more high level solution, but basically it involves using generators that yield future objects, okay? This is the, the approach that Guido took when he decided to move to the async world, and this is also the solution that we've worked with. So, and yeah, it works great with async IO. Async IO again, it's the module that was introduced in Python 3.4, if I'm correct. Um, by order of Guido uh, to kind of make Python com competitive again um, in the network world because it was really losing a lot of um, customers because of the scalability <coughs> issues it had without having these, uh, again, non blocking CDIO, even group based solutions. That's what the CDIO brings to Python. Um, so, one important aspect of, um, of Appio when it comes to asynchronous, is being asynchronous is not, uh, it's not like a feature of, um, of a framework. It's much more than that. Uh, to be able to be asynchronous, you have to be asynchronous all over your application, all the way from the router of the, of the, um, of the, of the framework to the ACP client that you're, that you're going to use, and the uh, uh, mobile driver that you're going to use to access the database, 
uh, the way you access the file system, everything should be as simple as ready. And uh, because Appier has that uh, some batteries included philosophy, we are able to kind of follow the complete process all the way to the data layer, for instance, or the file system, or a remote HTTP call, and be able to provide a synchronous uh, I.O. Uh, through all these uh, steps in a similar solution. Uh, obviously, there are people working, for instance, to be fast, more than with Django, trying to provide a synchronous solutions for them, uh, for it. Um, but they're kind of sluggish, and, uh, and again, it's an external dependency that you don't know if it's going to be maintained, and it's not tightly coupled with the uh, with the base flat code base. Okay, so <laughs> giving a quick example of how a non-async uh, route that basically runs uh, an external get, HTTP <coughs> get request, look like. So pretty simple. Again, a route that uh, binds itself to the to the to the root of the of the domain, <coughs> and that basically. Because this appear.get, this is basically our our wrapper around HTTP clients uh, that should return uh, the contents of this URL and then it returns it to the to the appear refresher and it basically handles this and presents it to the to the final user agent. This is simple, this is really simple, but this is as as a really huge limitation where basically this call would block. Uh, and this depends on the kind of web server that you're going to use for so for, for this app here. But if the web server is um, a typical uh, event loop not blocking the old one, you're going to block the loop uh, for the time of the request. And, uh, and yeah, basically you're not going to be able to handle any, any other request uh, while this client request um, is being handled. So if, it, if this takes two seconds to to retrieve this page, the server will block and everything for two seconds. Okay, are we getting this, this message of how it works? Okay, and then let me follow. So, how will this look like in an async uh, fashion? Keep in mind that this is an example that only works uh, with Python <coughs> or later, uh, because there were there was a lot of changes in Python uh, since the three five or on the three five. Version um, again, we're compatible or at least compatible with lower versions. But uh, this example would, would look like a lot more cryptic than this one. So anyway, so just two special uh, keywords: the async one uh, before the def. So basically, defining this function to be a, a coroutine generated one. Um, long story short. What it does is it uh, runs a series of tricks, and this is the like kind of the secret sauce. It's really complicated and the doing stuff, but it basically marks this function as being a sequence, okay? Or for what matters, it's this. And then you just run this await thing here, and you're saying that okay, uh, web server engine, just wait for this request to complete, okay? And then when this is completed. Uh, the, the future, the, the, the tricky future object gets notified that this request is completed and the call stack is returned to the same position. It's pretty tricky, uh, but it's it's awesome. And uh, I challenge anyone to build a really scalable kind of microservice architecture not using this kind of approach. Um, obviously, for, for simple examples, a uh, thing will thread pull of 60 or something threads should do it, you, you were able to handle 60 connections at the same time uh, in parallel, but if you go to um, more complex scenarios, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging. Um, so yeah, this is really the way to go uh, when building this kind of microservices architecture or whatever. Anything should go this way. Um, another example, and this one basically demonstrates how support for that uh, async IO library that I talked before, so that's that's the thing that came in Python 3.4. Um, here we're using the slip coroutine function uh, to wait for three seconds before running the HTTP request, just, just to play around. Uh, obviously, this, this slip is completely different from the time of slip that we're used to work, to, to work with. Time of slip basically, basically blocks the thread for, for three seconds. This one is going to do all the, all the async tricks that I, 
that I talked about, and it's not going to block um, the main thread. It's just going to return the call stack all the way up to the web server. Uh, the web server is going to register for that future. In the future, you're going to be notified after three seconds. Long story short, it waits for three seconds and it returns back here. Uh, then it runs the um, again the same get request, but now using directly AOHDB. Basically, this is for those who know requests. This is the equivalent and the equivalent of requests for the synchronous uh, IO. Okay, so this is to demonstrate that we work well also with the. Uh, with, uh, with these external libraries that rely on the CIO. And this might, say, might sound obvious that we should work well with, uh, with all sorts of uh, asynchronous libraries, but that's not really the case. As I said, as I said all of these should work together. And uh, we really need to be careful when, uh, when talking about asyncIO. Sometimes, some contexts uh, in another environment may have these requests and response stuff not working. Okay, so Appier is ready for that. Some other things may not be as ready as this one. Another example, and now showing up how our uh, data layer works uh, also very well with, uh, with the signal programming. Um, and really simple example, a person model that gets instantiated with a single name. Uh, it gets stored, and again, with, with the await a keyword meaning that we should wait for that to be persisted in the database. Uh, all the communication being done for instance, in this case, probably Mongo. Uh, and then only while after we get the confirmation from Mongo that uh, everything is stored, we return the call stack here. Um, person ID is printed, whatever. And then we we'll try to re retrieve the person again using an asynchronous. Uh, strategy for that and then again not blocking uh, the main thread and, um, and retrieving the person and then returning the person.net that basically serializes the object into a dictionary and returns it and again because we have auto serialization of, uh, of objects into JSON we should return a JSON uh, dictionary. Okay, everything clear here and you got the idea of how a series is important, it's important to have that. Uh, from now on. So I'm going to speak just a little bit on the more and the commodity stuff that you get, that you typically get on uh, on any other web framework. Uh, so templates, nothing new here, and all, nothing really new for, for, for those who are used with the, or are used with, with Flask. Um, modular template support meaning that uh, any of you can build an engine uh, to adapt uh, the way we work with templates uh, to another engine, to another template engine, but we uh, we kind of love Jinja 2, that's the template engine that uh, Flask uses, obviously because we came from Flask, we want to keep keep using the same um, template engine, and the template engine has been updated really recently, and this is probably the only piece of software that we rely on third parties to develop, uh, but luckily enough, uh, the Jinja 2 guys, that are the same guys that build Flask, have added a sync rendering support for Jinja. And again, as I said before, it's important to have a sync support with all layers. If there's no async support in, uh, for instance, if there was no async support in the template layer, we would not be able to call uh, our applications uh, async ready, only if we didn't use any kind of templates. Otherwise, everything should be async ready. For instance, if uh, in the middle of the async rendering, we access the file system, we should do it in the async fashion and only using this async rendering approach. It's possible to have propagation of, of uh, synchronous. Um, a little bit on models. And uh, again, we try to keep it simple. Always the same philosophy, always following the same, same core ideas of flies. We try to keep it simple and, uh, and provide a really thin layer uh, on top of, for instance, what PyMongo offers. PyMongo basically stores everything from a from dictionary and propagates uh, back to the database. Obviously, we wanted to work with classes. We wanted to provide some kind of business logic, if needed, on the on the model layer. Uh, but yeah, it's really simple. It basically gathers all the fields in the model and serializes them to a dictionary and sends it to the backend. Backend, again, modular, just like the template one. You can build uh, a storage engine um, that you want. We currently have support for 
MongoDB, TinyDB, Tiny, Tiny it's simple, that file based database, something equivalent to <coughs> SQLite, but on a more NoSQL uh, manner. And uh, we're working to provide uh, mostly uh, <coughs> uh, support also. Uh, common stuff, validation stuff, so uh, you map your model or your form in the, in the web page to a certain model. There is validations, it propagates using exceptions. There's pre, post, and on hook, so pre save, pre update, or whatever. Um, so you can override those methods and do some kind of business logic tricks. There's a really cool feature, we call it custom type support. So it's really easy. One of the things that we wanted uh, to do when we build these uh, models layer or data layer on Appier is to have a simple way of building custom types. Uh, we don't really love the concept of only using basic types or individual strings. Uh, we consider even lists and dictionaries as simple types, but we want more. We want to be able to really build really cool stuff uh, around types, and I'm going to show some. Uh, so it's it's really a matter of kind of building these loads dumps, so serialized, deserialized uh, methods, and it should be something as simple as that. Uh, and yeah, it's in support just like I've shown before. So a quick example on how a model looks like in, in Appier. Uh, again, really simple design, uh, just inherits from the model class, uh, defined in fields. Uh, each field has patterns of, uh, of parameters, some, some of the interesting ones, so defining the type, we're just using basic types here, uh, define if you want to index the um, the field in the database, and by saying to using the most common one, so for instance, Mongo is B3 in hash. Um, here we're defining the identifier to be something how to implement it. Nothing new here. Again, this is a really interesting one. So, name why just defining field? Because if you don't define things like type, you, you, you so we kind of follow the convention, all the configuration things that came all the way from the movie. Uh, so, if you don't define type, you Basically, assuming that this is going to be a string. So, name is a string. Uh, this is a way to really have a really compact code base. Um, another example, and this one shows up that custom type feature that I was talking about. And this is a really cool example of what can be done with these custom types. We're defining here a type that it's basically an image. This is obviously going to be serialized, uh, in this case, as a dictionary containing. Base 64 uh, bytes, but it doesn't matter how this is going to be stored in the database. What it matters is that I'm asking that this thumbnail field of the person model should be an image or must be an image of 400 per 400 pixels uh, in the PNG format. So, whenever, I, so if this is bound to, um, to a HTML form, uh, one of those file forms that upload images, it's going to automatically resize this image. Uh, to the to the request size and convert it from whatever form of G JPEG to PNG, and this is all done using this uh, custom type uh, infrastructure. And it's really cool to have this kind of business logic, business logic, but this uh, conversion logic inside a type and completely abstract it from the um, from the developer. It's it's kind of cool. So here's a quick example of how this is. Achieve. Obviously, this image type is much more complex than this one. We're here trying. Here, we're trying to to build a custom big type uh, field. This is just for, for demonstration purposes only because this is not really useful. Um, what we do here is uh, basically implement these loads and dump stuff. This is going to be called whenever I want to store this uh, this um, this field to the database and. Obviously, I should be able to convert it to some, some, some kind of basic data type that is understandable by our data layer, and this converts it to a float, I think. Um, and then I should be able to convert it back to the internal representation of the, um, of the, of the type, so that it can be used. Um, so this gets called whenever I want to store something in the database, and this gets called whenever I want to choose something from the database. Right? And this, this kind of defines how simple interfaces are, are uh, also very powerful. And uh, this simple concept is able to really solve a lot of problems in a cool manner. So, 
we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I made this presentation to be 20 to 40 minutes, so I'm just going to summarize some other cool features of the of AirView. And I must say that some of them are not really part of what we call AirView. They are part of AirView extras. That's basically a, a set of extensions to AirView, uh, following that extensibility support we have. Uh, so we have a NetBean interface that we think looks a lot, looks a lot better than the Django one for this coming from Django. We have that access control layer that I told uh, that I told before. So we have, for instance, something that you basically decorate those uh, action methods, those routes, where you're saying, okay, this route can only, can only be accessed by someone, by a user that can think that has an ACL token named Kermin, and, and it, take care, it takes care of everything. So it can be user if required. It's kind of the access control uh, infrastructure that you get in Django, but we think it's a lot simpler and more tightly coupled with the code where it needs to be, at least. Uh, this is a really cool feature, auto snapshotting of models. Uh, this is something that uh, basically what it does is um, whenever you define a model, if you, if you mark it to be snapshot, whenever you make a change to a certain entity, uh, so for instance, you save a person with a name uh, to be used, and then you resave it with the name Joao, uh, the first version gets automatically saved using a series of trees, again, modular, so you can even build your own engine of the serialization of these changes, and then you have an interface pretty much similar with the time machine one that everyone is familiar with Mac OS, but for the interface. It's a really cool feature and really useful one. And again, this, is, this has been built a lot uh, out of necessity, and some of the use cases that we had uh, back then were kind of uh, enterprise related, and uh, in the corporate environment, you cannot erase any kind of information. If you just override the previous information with a new one, you, you cannot erase it. And uh, building this snapshot uh, feature inside, not every regular access, it's really cool. Uh, then another cool feature, encrypted model fields. Basically, this is a layer. Uh, so here you have uh, sense of some, some fields. Uh, for this field, so, so parameters for this field, you would say, okay, this is going to be uh, encrypted field, and uh, there are the, there's the master key that you can provide a, a, a specific key for that field. But the cool part is that as a developer, you don't see any difference in terms of interface. You just work with that field uh, as if it was not encrypted in the database. So whenever you retrieve, it gets decrypted. Whenever you store, it gets encrypted. Really cool feature. Um, app configuration. App configuration is really a top level priority. We want to make uh, so when we built app here, we used to deploy it to Oracle. Now we're deploying it uh, using Docker containers and on our infrastructure, most of the time at least. Uh, configuration is really top priority. The way we handle it, it's quite cool. So everything, so Everywhere in templates, in the controllers, in the app, in the, the models, it's possible to access configuration, it's possible to make decisions based on, on configuration. And the way these JSON and these environment variables and even the database it kind of controls it, it's really nice. We need to take a look at that. So, what kind of customers do we have? We, as I said, we had some high profile uh, customers back then, so Microsoft is probably the most. Uh, preeminent one of the of this set. Uh, there's some code base on their dev Windows domain that uses Azure and uh, extensively and uh, with a certain scale. Uh, so yeah, probably that's the biggest and the highest profile. But yeah, but again, we also use it here platform and we also have some some pretty cool websites running Azure in production. So Carl, for instance, uh, and, uh, and others. It's very cool. So, kind of wrapping up this presentation, remembering the original or the name of the presentation. Um, at Hive Solutions, we have, a, we have a very concrete idea on what uh, Joyful or API programming uh, should look like. Uh, this is uh, my opinion and the opinion of the others, probably uh, members of Hive Solutions. Uh, and I know that it doesn't represent the opinion of everyone. But we do think that uh, having fun, having joy, uh, being happier, uh, 
uh, ou media de programming uh, web app should, should imply, for instance, having a minimal set of dependencies. And I know that this is always uh, a sweet spot, uh, uh, a kind of polemic uh, opinion, but having a lot of dependencies later on is always uh, going to create the dependency hell problem and you're going to have a lot of difficulties progressing, for instance, in your Python based version because there's a dependency that's, that doesn't work in Python 3.5 and you want to move to Python 3.5 because it has the, all those um, asynchronous cool uh, features, but you can't, but you have, because you have a dependency that relies on Python 3.1, whatever. Um, so having a minimal set of dependencies is really critical. So that basically is our problem with Flask, and that's why we built uh, uh, everything from scratch. We think that you should own your code, and owning code is not about uh, committing to the repository, it's really understanding it. And uh, we do think it's easy to not completely own your code if you use, uh, for instance, Django. Um, having code that scales properly, and obviously it's not the code that scales, the code that scales, it's always, a, it's always the application that it represents, but what this means is that you shouldn't compromise on these. It's really important for you to understand the kind of commitment you make when you choose between uh, framework A and framework B, between web server A and web server B, between technology A and B. It's really important to, to have this code that, that you can rely on, uh, something that really scales. And it's really, really important to keep things simple. Uh, Every complex tool, every complex tool, um, piece of software, uh, ranging from the Linux kernel to whatever the CLang compiler, CLang compiler or the LVM infrastructure, whatever, every complex piece of software should be built on really simple tools. You shouldn't be forced to use complex tools from scratch. You should really start always start from the yellow world um, example. And the whole world example should really be simple and uh, clear thing. So yeah, that's it. I hope I've um, opened the appetite of every, every single one of you uh, to learn more about Apure. This is really uh, just scratching the surface of what Apure really is. So, uh, so yeah, that's it.